Well, let me begin. Uh, let me begin by introducing the program and welcoming you all to the Future Trends Forum. I'm very glad to see you and hopefully hear from you all today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, co-host, and chief cadre. Now, I'd really be very, very glad to introduce this week's guest. Um, Michael Roth is the president of Wesleyan University uh, in New England. He is one of the leading presidents um, in the higher education space. He's a leader as well in the liberal education space. On top of that, along with me, he's a humanist who has produced a whole series of books. He's a fantastic teacher and innovator in teaching with technology and just one of the brightest people in higher education. I'm delighted that you can make time to join us and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Welcome, President Roth. Thank you, Brian. Happy to be here. Oh, I'm really, really glad to be here. Um, let me just begin by asking you uh, the question that I ask everybody on this program. I just introduced you with some of your titles and some of your background and some of your output. But let me ask this question. Looking ahead to the next academic year, what are the big topics, the big ideas that are going to be top of mind for you? Well, and, and in my case at Wesleyan, the um, the the topics that are coming to the forefront have to do with issues of uh, affordability, um, making sure that um, the students we bring to Wesleyan are able to to get the most out of their experience there because cool. they um, have full access to the resources of the institution uh, and acquire a little debt uh, or no debt while attending school. Uh, I'm also very interested in uh, the uh, continued development of programs that cut across departments. And mm. Uh, mm. as I've told uh, my the department chairs at Wesleyan again and again, if I had my way, I'd get rid of all the departments. But as they as they tell me, you won't get your way. Because <laughs> uh, I <laughs> they, do think they that appreciate the most, that. The, the most uh, exciting work is is often usually done uh, between departments or with uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. So we're continuing to explore how to build uh, interdisciplinary collaborations th of an unexpected sort, uh, which bring our scientists and artists together mm. uh, or people interested in education uh, and politics. Um, and for the next year, um, I have to say that I am wrestling with the issue of how to uh, create a uh, the proper vehicle so that our students can participate in the next election cycle, which I think is mm. uh, of such great mm. importance. Uh, and so uh, we say, like many liberal arts schools, that um, we think that civic preparedness is uh, a fundamental aspect of liberal education. Uh, and I find myself asking uh, the question of like, so given the, the extraordinary importance of the, the coming election in a year from now, um, yes. what are we doing as an institution to empower our students to participate, not just going to vote, absolutely important, but uh, between now and uh, that day when they vote to actually work on campaigns in places where they may make a difference. You know, some uh, students who are in various political parties, uh, are, of course, we, we're not going to steer them one person direction or another. But I think it's really important for us to find ways as an institution to help students engage at a level that's beyond testing something on campus or, or advocating for change on campus. That's also, uh, you know, as important. But um, the national uh, level in the next year or so will actually create a very different context for everything else we do, uh, mm. uh, depending on how things work out. So I am working hard with uh, some of the people at Wesleyan who, who do this all the time to think about how we can energize our students to spend time in, in swing states or work on local elections or whatever, however they want to do it, but to really get involved um, in at this moment in American uh, democracy uh, and and to make a difference and to learn from that involvement uh, in ways that inform the rest of their lives. That's a tremendous call. Um, I have I have all kinds of questions on it, but before I pounce, let me just remind everybody 
all of you participating that um, this event is for you to ask your questions and to ask your comments. Uh, so if you'd like to ask uh, President Roth about uh, voting or about interdisciplinary work, in fact, we already had a comment in one of the chat boxes, uh, Michael, which was um, innovation happens in the interstices, uh, which is quite true. Um, you know, I'd love to hear your questions and thoughts. So again, either just click the uh, raised hand button so that I can beam you up on stage or type in a question uh, in the text box. Um, a quick question about the, the last point um, is uh, Connecticut, um, has the government uh, made any efforts to either uh, enhance or retard student access to voting next year? Uh, no, I, I think the, uh, you know, that the, there have been, uh, we just had an election yesterday, uh, Tuesday, Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, and uh, actually a young Wesleyan alumnus was elected mayor of Middletown. Uh, and uh, there was some, some grumbling from some citizens who think it's really not fair that students actually uh, play such an important role but I think that's, no one's actually mo trying to, to prevent people from voting. Actually, they facilitated voting. And in town, uh, the registration, uh, not just students, but just all citizens in the city skews in a certain way. And some person with a Democratic nomination won, which is not the biggest surprise. He is quite young, uh, in his 20s still, and, and so that, that was surprising. But I think for our students, what's interesting is they get to see that they can make a difference working on a campaign, voting. We have a state representative, a state senator named Matthew Lesser, uh, who actually, um, I think he, he dropped out of school uh, at some point, thought he'd run for office. <laughs> I don't, the story is he didn't expect to win. He had to come back to school. And now, I don't know, it's more than a decade later, he's still in the state legislature now in the Senate. Um, and he's an excellent legisl uh, legislator. Huh. I should say that one of the things that happens when, when alumni f find themselves in these roles, they have to show that they are at least impartial vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis the university. So it's not as if we're, we're getting somebody to do our bidding, not, a, not at all. But we are pleased to see how our uh, young alumni can uh, make have real success in the in the electoral system, but it all because that energizes participation. People not just running for office, but working on campaigns. Uh, last year we did micro grants uh, uh, over fall break uh, during the midterm elections, giving mm. people basically pizza and, and gas money uh, to go and, and knock on doors in in uh, competitive races, uh, uh, various places in the country, and quite a few people did it, and they wrote up their reactions. And of course, when you knock on doors uh, off campus, you discover people with a much wider range of views than you might find on campus. Sure. And I think that was just educational for them. And yeah. and I think, again, our, our job is not to give them four years of campus politics, which then stay as an isolated object of nostalgia when they graduate, but actually give them the habits of participating in the civic dimension in the public realm, which they can Ooh. continue to do after they graduate. Mm, well, that's terrific. Um, I, I have questions before I could say anything. Um, our wonderful forum crowd has its own questions. So okay. Let me just uh, flash a few of these up on the screen. I'll read them out loud. Um, the first one is from the excellent Robert McGuire, who asks, you mentioned full access for students when they are there. I suppose you mean affording to attend is just one part of the equation, right? And yeah. how do you support access after admission? Yeah, I, I, it's, it's a great question. And I, I have to say that I, I've been slower to recognize this than I uh, than I wish I had been. That um, whether it's food insecurity or just not uh, understanding, let's say how to get an internship uh, or other things that um, affect student performance. And uh, I think it's Professor Jack, uh, uh, who's at the Harvard School of Education, who's written powerfully about this recently um, about his own experience at Amherst College as a low-income student. Uh, that there are many ways in which uh, the the college just it's a full scholarship plus room and board. It seems like a lot uh, to the administrator, right? And it is a lot uh -huh. to the administrator. But to the student, if you if you're homeless when you're not in the dorm, that's a real problem. Uh, if you're working three jobs to send money home to your grandparents or your yeah. parents, yeah. that 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 creates a different uh, realm of issues. They won't even go to the infirmary when they're sick because they don't now actually it's free. Mm. And I think a lot, of, I speak for myself, I, I didn't 
understand some of the nuances of that for a while. Now, it's a challenge because um, America is today is so unequal uh, that uh, you, you can't replicate the experience of a rich student for a, school, for a poor student. Uh, rich students are going to do a lot of things that most that a lot of people can't, others can't do. Right. Uh, so we can't try to replicate that kind of privilege, but we can provide access to the, the tools that provide students upon graduation with uh, access to economic mobility and meaningful work. Well, that's that's a very, very thoughtful and sensitive answer. Uh, thank you, Robert. That was a terrific question. Uh, if you want to follow that up, Robert, please, uh, please let us know. Um, we have another question from the uh, awesome Stephen Ehrman, um, who asks, um, to encourage more interdisciplinary teaching and research, what steps are you taking or considering? And, and then he follows this up by saying, uh, he's asking about sustained interdisciplinary work, not just yeah. projects. Great question, great question. Great question. Yeah. So, um, you know, Wesleyan has this long history of interdisciplinary work going back to the 1950s, and mm. they set up colleges of social studies and letters back, way back then where people would be uh, not just encouraged, but really required to teach in, outside their fields. Nice. Uh, there's a lot of team teaching. The departments were broken down into these interdisciplinary units, uh, and those have been going strong. So when I came as president, in 2007, I thought the best way to commemorate the 50th anniversary of these colleges was to create a new college. So we did. We created the College of the Environment uh, oh. under the direction yeah. of a biologist, uh, uh, Barry Chernoff. Mm -hmm. and Barry, Barry ha had in mind that everybody in the College of the Environment would have an environmental science major plus another major. So it could be environmental science plus economics or government or anthropology or dance or music or film. And, and then he would bring these people together in a research environment when they get to be juniors and seniors with outside an outside scholar and also faculty who given release time um, to work on projects together. And it goes from you know carbon taxes and the economics of uh, that kind of policy to landscape painting. <laughs> I mean, each year is a little different. And, and, and you get people who normally don't talk about the work together to talk about their work together and to try to write something together or produce mm. a, a, a performance uh, and as also to, to let them continue their own work let's say in economic not by these broader conversations so uh, so it may sustain money it's not a big secret you need to get money so that these uh, these programs aren't an afterthought and so what I try to do is uh, raise money for centers and programs so that, uh, you know, faculty and students will know where the resources are. And my, my sense is, on, generally speaking, it's not always the case, but generally speaking, uh, departments function by seniority. Uh, the oldest person right. gets the resources. Uh, yeah. Interdisciplinary programs uh, function by uh, who has the best idea. Uh, and, hmm. and, and that, to me, is, you know, coming from a design and art school in California before I saying that, that, you know, that's the way to do it. You, you want to give people the possibility of, you know, iterative work because they have a good idea, give them resources, see what happens, and then start over with the net, net next year with another team. So we created the College of the Environment. Now we added three more interdisciplinary colleges in the last uh, five years or so, uh, eight years, uh, College of Film and the Moving Image. College of right. East Asian Studies, right? College of Integrated Sciences, and that's pretty interesting. Uh, the scientists told me that the scientific study department, just like most humanity problems. So, if you're doing um, genetics, you have to be doing some computer science too, or if you're doing molecular right. biology, you're right. likely to be doing things with chemists, and and so. Uh, we created the College of Integrated Sciences to, to give uh, resources, uh, research money, uh, advising uh, to people whose work is uh, doesn't have to be squeezed into a department, but proudly wears the banner of multiple disciplines. Hmm. And I, I think that um, I haven't had to steal the money away from the departments to do that, so they haven't been hostile to it. And I think people have seen the, the proof in the pudding. They've seen that good work is coming out and they want more of it rather than uh, retrenchment towards 
silos that you know usually are less interesting anyway. So you, this was all a key piece of this is that you funded these new colleges externally to the pre-existing ones. Yeah, most on the on the whole, that's the case. In College of the Environment, the uh, the, the faculty member is actually a very good fundraiser too. And oh, nice. And and um, we have a center for the humanities that's been around, you know, since uh, 1959. Also, uh, was then the Center for Advanced Study. And when I in the early 2010s around there, it, they had an endowment after 50 years of 350 bucks. Somebody sold a painting and put kept the money in a drawer, I think, in the director's <laughs> office. And with the help of the Mellon Foundation, we uh, we were able to build a six million dollar endowment. So you know we're a small place. That's enough money actually to provide a base of operations and experimentation. Now I have to say, you know, it's not like I uh, that the president of the university should have any say in the content of these programs, and I don't. You know, I. I go to the Center for Humanities regularly and I'm regularly annoyed <laughs> by what's happening, you know, and that's good, right? I'm supposed to be, as I get older, I, I'm getting, you know, uh, more get off my lawn kind of mentality. <laughs> and it's great that they have an endowment yeah. with, all, with all seriousness because yeah. it doesn't depend on the people in the administrative chairs anymore. So once you create these uh, funds, whether they're endowment or just longstanding uh, resources, you don't have to depend on the interest of the president or the provost or dean. You can really work with the, the active researchers and teachers in the field uh, with the resources available to do this interesting stuff. No, oh, that's an important point. Um, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, for, for everybody else, uh, let me just... Um, uh, remind you that uh, it's really, really easy to ask questions. Um, and uh, in fact, as I typed, as I said this, someone just added another question. Um, if you would like to uh, join us on stage, uh, just hit the uh, raised hand button and I can beam you on stage. Um, in fact, speaking of which, uh, we have a question from uh, Leslie Harris. Let me just bring this up. Um, it's from Bucknell. Um, I'm wondering how these colleges interact with the existing departments. Do they offer team taught courses? Or do they offer courses not already in the curriculum? Yeah, that's a great question. So it, it varies. They're not all the same. So uh, the old ones, the College of Social Studies and the College of Letters, they have their own curriculum. But but yeah. uh, and 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 what they have in common is is their three year majors rather than two year majors, as most of our majors are. The people enter after their first year. Uh, and in at least, I think both cases, they don't have grades for a significant amount of time. They have outside examiners, and there's a significant amount of team teaching. In the College of Letters, there are faculty appointments specifically in that interdisciplinary program, and there have been for a long time. College of Social Studies, it's really the faculty culture of when it got started. The department said, we'll just you know, every year history will give someone to that college and every year philosophy will give someone. And that, as you predictably, that has not always gone smoothly. <laughs> Sometimes people don't want to do it. Sometimes there's personality conflicts. Mm. But on the whole, it's worked well in the sense that the students get a cast of, of teachers who are predisposed to interdisciplinary work um, and have classes they other, that otherwise does not exist in the curriculum. Uh, right now in the College of the Environment, uh, Charles Siebert, the New York Times uh, writer and uh, a journalist, poet, uh, is there work, uh, working with a group of faculty and students on the ways in which uh, non-human animals communicate. Uh, yeah. It's something cool. he's worked on a lot. And, and, and cool. there's a literary critic, a sociologist, and a bunch of students working together. Uh, and um, the things they come up with otherwise they wouldn't be there. In film, there, many of the courses were there already, but they were able to, to bring together a major and a minor under one roof and also include lots of people who are teaching film courses who are in the languages or in history or other places um, that were get, kind of just disparately scattered around the, the curriculum. So it varies a little bit. Um, what all of these are have in common is that they take seriously the, the function of what I, what I call cohort building so that yeah, it's not yeah. just like if I'm a, an economics major, I may have some friends who are economics majors that may take some classes with them and not with others. But, but if I'm in the college of letters, let's say, um, I actually take 
one class each semester with the same 15 people for my academic career, we take our exams together. We, you know, there are all these bonding uh, moments where you come together as an intellectual community. Mm. And I think that's, uh, it happens in film as well, because, you know, mm -hmm. everybody has to make a film in their junior, senior year, and you can't make it by yourself. So right. if Brian's making a film, he needs uh, somebody to carry the equipment, and Roth will carry the equipment for Brian. But when I'm making my film, I'm going to turn to Brian <laughs> and say, you know, what are, what are you doing this weekend? And everybody crews for each other. And yeah. that creates a, a, a culture of collaboration, which I think... Mm. Uh, is really important to to many uh, of the all of these interdisciplinary uh, uh, colleges. So it does expand the curriculum and it expands res research opportunities uh, for our students. Well, that sounds that just sounds fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I teach a digital video storytelling production, and that's always always collaborative. Um, yeah. Uh, speaking of collaborative, uh, we have a few more questions that have just come in. Um, as, as always, once we get going, we, it's hard to stop. So let me just bring uh, a longtime friend and supporter of the program, Tom Hames uh, from Texas. Let's bring him on stage. Hello, Tom. Can you see me or hear me? Oh, there yes. I am. See and hear you. Hello, All the right. Texas Institute. So, um, Question I have for you is that as you're going, as you went into these new programs and these interdisciplinary programs, you're obviously, um, shall we say, forging new ground, plowing new fields. Um, what kind of process do you have uh, to figure out what's working and what's not, and how do you iterate? Uh, I mean, these are, these sound like big uh, ocean liner ships, not little speedboats, and so I'm I'm always curious about organizational change. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the the the, the I, I think that we've been able to innovate with some instigation from the from the top, from the president's office, from me, <laughs> and then and some resources. Um, and then I have to find hospitable <laughs> faculty or people who actually think this is a good idea and not just interested in the extra little extra money for two semesters. So in the college and the environment, you know, the, the Barry Chernoff had this idea. Uh, and when I did a call for, I did it when I started, it's a long time ago now, more than 12 years ago, I, I did a call to the faculty for new ideas. And I, I said, I would pick with some help of uh, consult, consulting with faculty and students, I would pick uh, three or four things that we're going to work on for five years. And uh, I always remember a faculty member said, and the faculty member said, well, what if my idea isn't one of those three? <laughs> I said, well, we're not going to do it. And she looked at me like I was insane. <laughs> and I said, you know, okay, if I, I'm going to propose, I worked on Hegelianism for a long time. So I said, I'm going to propose the Hegelian Institute at Wesleyan. And, oh, you know, yes. if it doesn't, and if it doesn't go, you can't raise money for it. No one at Wesleyan can raise money for it. Hmm. And this was a shock to some people. I mean, it seemed to me just a definition of what it means to have a priority. But hmm. for many people, they were under the illusion that they could go off and raise their own money. And did, that they didn't really do it, but it was an illusion. And it was really a distraction, I think, from getting stuff done. Uh, once the college environment was up and running, people then came to see me and said, oh, I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. Um, and I'd have to try to test the waters. I'll give you another example. It kind of, uh, it was both down and up. Uh, I when I came from the California College of the Arts, a very strong design programs and architecture program, and I was surprised Wesleyan didn't have a design program. And uh, the reaction I got made me think that the folks believed I was talking about like how to decorate an office. Um, and <laughs> and I, uh, you know, we worked very closely with IDEO at CCA and other really interesting companies. I thought mm. it was perfect mm -hmm. for a liberal arts college. But when we went around and talked to faculty and I had a friend that uh, I dispatched uh, to do this, they were very reticent. They did not want to uh, design and engineering. No, no, no. So I had to wait actually. And, and I went around the country with, uh, talking to engineering uh, uh, pedagogues and talked to some design innovators who were all very encouraging. But it was when a younger group of faculty got tenure and then I was able to get some grant money uh, yeah. to do this. Uh, not a lot, just a little bit to see if it would work. Um, uh, then suddenly the kind of guy in chemistry who said, well, actually I do material science. You know, I could, I could teach that 
course. I usually teach it from ideas to, to projects, but I could also teach it from projects to ideas. <laughs> and, and I have a person in physics who said that, and then I have a person in design who said that. And suddenly we had our, you know, you only need a handful of people to get something started at a small place. Wesleyan has 3,000 undergraduates roughly. And so suddenly we, you know, it was five years of not much happening and then a little money, a few younger people getting tenure. Mm -hmm. And I think the example of these other colleges, now that's not yet a college, that's a, it's just a minor, uh, but it'll be a major very soon. There's a lot of interest. And so I think that the change comes from, I think having a senior administrators who actually want change, having mm -hmm. faculty and some, to open change and having a board uh, and owners who, who trust the senior administrators uh, enough to give them funds to try to see if something works. And your question was also, how do you know it works? For me, it's enrollments, uh, the uh, production of new knowledge, whether it's uh, exhibitions that get reviewed positively or papers that get accepted uh, into scientific journals, uh, yeah, yeah, and exactly. and depending on depending on the program, you know, they should set the criteria for success when we start it, so mm -hmm. that we know after a few years whether it, it should be sunset or it should be extended. You know, you all know this. I'm sure that you know, we at university are very good at starting stuff, not so good at right. killing things. Right. Um, and 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 so we we're we're trying to be a little bit uh, smarter about that. That not everything we start has to last. Uh, mm -hmm. It could lead to something better, or it could just be you know you, you had a bad idea. And, uh, we we talk about encouraging failure. It means we have to fail sometimes. <laughs> right. So I think that's where to pivot, part of it. right. So I mean that's the key with design is you have to know where to make that where to make that left turn and understand and have the program be flexible enough to where you can go well this is working and this isn't and we're, we we are going to throw everything out but maybe we need to make a slight realignment you know the the exactly. famous story of YouTube starting out as a dating service right cool. so. <laughs> yeah or yeah no I think that's a really great point and and um, helping. Uh, faculty, especially the younger faculty, understand that pivoting is a good thing. You know, that's right. not a, it's not a mistake right. necessarily that, it, you know, that, that, that we encourage uh, uh, revision right. and, and that that's, that's a positive thing. And, you know, trying to model that as well, like, you know, to, 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 to show that the administration is on their side. Actually, we're, we're trying to do this in the right. same way. I mean, they don't really need my ideas. They really, I need, one thing a president can do is raise money in ways you, most faculty can't. So I'm conscious of the fact that though I, I have ideas oh, sure. and I like, I like my own ideas. <laughs> I mean, but really what I can do as a president is come back with some money to, to, to help people do yeah. the experience their own ideas. Right. Well, speaking of ideas, we have another, another question coming in. Um, Tom, thank you so much. That was a great question. Um, let me welcome Roxanne, one of the long-term friends of the program and also a fan of yours, President Ra. Yes, I am. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was one of your students in your course, How to Change the World, a few years ago. On oh. I'm the Google Glass girl, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. and I'm happy um, to see you and excited to ask you um, how I've changed the world and what are your thoughts on how technology can change the world as a university professor in um, a couple of ways with your faculty and your students? How do you feel that going forward with, you know, pedagogy and innovating uh, virtu uh, VR and um, artificial intelligence will affect us? Wow. Great question. Wow. <laughs> Sorry, great guys. I didn't pack that up too neatly, but <laughs> no. no, that's it's a great it's a great question. So um, I, I, I'm afraid I, I don't have a great answer to that question because um, uh, I see my role really as enabling people who know a lot more about technology than I to um, experiment in ways that uh, that let me, let's use the phrase human centered technological innovation like human-centered right. design. Um, I, I do think that AI underscores what should always be at the heart 
of a liberal education, which is not the exchange of information. I mean, people have confused liberal arts education with saying, I took X, you know, I took philosophy or I, I, I learned that about some art history. And in other words, and what they mean by that is like, I can do IDs. You know, I look at a painting, and I say, oh, that's a, a Monet. Or I, or I listen to some music and say, oh, that's Brahms. And that's my liberal education. Well, that's silly because my phone could do that. <laughs> um, and and uh, so what we want to be able to do is use technology um, uh, uh, to help create an environment in which students can use their imagination to ask questions that haven't yet been asked by either their faculty members or, or sometimes their fellow students. And, and sometimes that will come, I, I'm sure, though I'm sure only <laughs> abstractly, I haven't experienced these things, but with immersive technologies and with uh, other forms of, of pedagogy that, um, that leverage the technology's ability to liberate the imagination. I put it that way because I do see, and I, I and this is, I feel like just an old guy who doesn't know a lot here, but I do see that in, for many of my students, technology is an excuse not to use their imagination. So they can, you know, depend on technology to get an, a quick answer or some information. So in my, I teach a rather large class uh, now uh, this semester on virtue and vice uh, from Confucius to Spike Lee. <laughs> and I, I ban technology in a classroom. And I cold call on people. And I am like, it's very old fashioned in a way. And I, I keep people on their toes in a face-to-face -face environment with 75 people. At least that's what my goal is. And that doesn't always work. Um, and I want them to be able to entertain ideas that they would otherwise find uh, uh, either irrelevant or insulting or outrageous to entertain those ideas uh, and to, and by entertain, I mean, pay attention and, to them in such a way as to as to see clearly why other people find them so compelling and that gives our students the experience of intellectual diversity now i i know that technology can do that too or technology can facilitate that just by connecting people with different kinds of ideas uh but i i do i um you know i kind of aim at intellectual diversity and the confrontation with difference as a vehicle for expanding one's imagination and insofar as technology can do that, that's a wonderful thing, because I do think changing the world in a positive sense will come from liberating the imagination, mm -hmm. giving people more access to compassion and care and more imagination mm -hmm. about how to, to, to direct that compassion and care. Mm. Thank you. That's that's a that's a fantastic, rich answer. Um, I'm a mindfulness educator and coach ah. I'm new to mindfulness. And I saw uh, in one of the uh, poetry and mindful books that you were um, referenced and talking about <laughs> liberal education and the book that you wrote of why is liberal education important and how has that um, idea resonated with decreasing interest in liberal art so, in the, at the universe at, in academe. That's a good question. Thank you. So, 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 so uh, I'll try to just say quickly that so about five or six years ago, I wrote this book called Beyond the University: Why Liberal Education Matters, and and um, uh, and I argued for what I just described, which is that liberal education shouldn't be just you check off a bunch of boxes saying what you what you took, but liberal education should develop habits of mind and spirit that allow you to pursue lifelong learning in a way that has an impact on the world beyond the university. I call the book Beyond the University because I always tell my students, I don't care if you have a great time while you're on campus. I mean, it's great to live on campus. Uh, I do care that you leave the campus, that you leave empowered, as a W. B. Boyce's word, empowered to take what you've learned as a resource for future learning and do stuff beyond the university. Hmm. I just uh, uh, published a, a new book uh, in the past few months called Safe Enough Spaces, mm -hmm. where I try to underscore how intellectual diversity um, and being open to, to challenge and leveraging free speech enables the kind of liberal education that I described in Beyond the University. Because I really think today there's a, there's a kind of uh, uh, wave of thinking that, that, that 
that seems to indicate we don't have time for a broad education and we don't uh, we the economy is too uh, winners take all to allow for breadth and and um, and context. But what I what I see on the contrary actually is that the people have big the big winners in this economy they they go to these fancy schools where they have a very broad education. Right. They want their children to go to those places. Right. And 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 so I see no reason not to have a pragmatic liberal education. Now, not one where you just say I'm proud because I know what a Monet looks like, yeah. but because I know how to use my education in the contemporary world. A pragmatic, yeah. a pragmatist education uh, yeah. that's based in breadth and context. And I want to argue for that because I do think that um, if we don't have such an education, we actually will accentuate inequality. That we we will we will condemn yeah. people to um, uh, uh, narrow or narrower lives because they've had a narrower education. Mm. That's a great defense of Thank you so much. And when are You're you going welcome. to teach another course on Coursera? Are you going to teach another course? You know, I love to teach on Coursera. Um, wonderful students. I, 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 you know what, but what's been disappointing to, for me, and I don't, you know, this is a, a bigger subject, is that in the Coursera used to really be cohort based. You know, I got to know the people who were kind of going, not all of them, of course, but some students going through the course yeah. at the same time. So every morning I would look at my bulletin board and I'd see people who were reacting to things. And as Coursera changed its business model, let me put it that way, and its approach to learning, um, they just, it just became, you know, on demand. Everybody takes what they want to come and go. And, and it's, as a teacher, I have little contact now with the community of learners or, or the student in the classes. And I, that was, I, I'm disappointed in that, but I haven't figured out what to do about my disappointment because Ooh. when the, those early days of MOOCs, when everybody was, you know, some people hyping and I, other were despairing, I actually was just saying, this is a very cool way to teach because I'm meeting all these people from all over the world who are seriously studying the stuff that I care about and helping me learn about it too. Yeah. But I feel like in recent years, I have not, I haven't found that same reciprocal learning uh, that was there in the beginning. Right. Mm. And right. I should think more about how to deal with that. Mm. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Always. Thank you. Thank you, Rexen. Uh, that sounds like a, uh, you heard it here first, friends, that there's a new need for a new kind of online class um, <laughs> called the, uh, the, the, maybe called the Roth MOOC. Um, yeah. If, if you're new to the forum, if you uh, haven't experienced this before, uh, bringing up guests like uh, Tom and Roxanne is, uh, is what we do. That's that easy to join us for video. Um, speaking of which, uh, we have more questions uh, came in, and we have a few folks who couldn't make it here um, in person uh, for schedule conflicts, and they wanted to share some questions. So let me just read these back. Uh, this is one from the uh, awesome uh, Joellen Parker, who asks, how can liberal arts education best prepare students to understand the issues raised by big data, AI, and other digital forces? Well, I think um, uh, an interdisciplinary approach is called for. I think we have to understand um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the way that technology works in some, in some basic form. Um, and we have to understand how it has emerged from specific social uh, and political conditions that um, privilege some kinds of markets uh, and some kinds of privacy uh, mm -hmm. and foreclose others. Uh, yeah. And I think we have to um, provide our students with the analytic tools to understand what's at stake when they participate in technologies that have access to intimate parts of their lives and when they think they're making use of a technology that may in fact be making use of them. So I, I think uh, liberal arts education shouldn't be technophobic in any way that it, uh, and, 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 and it should be open to using uh, we'll say again to as I said before to the last question to uh, liberate or open the imagination. I'll give you one example at, at Wesleyan. Uh, we have a, a, a bunch of folks working on mapping projects with mm. uh, uh, artificial intelligence and other forms of uh, of uh, mapping that and 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 visual representations of spatial relationships and networks that really show patterns that uh, historians, sociologists, and 
and and others just hadn't made visible before. And they couldn't do that with without the technology. Right. But but the technology is very much in the service of the questions these uh, scholars are asking rather than leading them only to ask questions that, to, that the technology lends itself to. So I, I think that that, that seems to be a, a, a good path for integrating uh, the breadth of liberal education with the tools that uh, increase the power of one's analytic uh, 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 capacities. Our, um, I'd love to follow up on some of those mapping projects uh, after this call, especially if any of those are uh, publicly available. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, that's that's a that's a really powerful answer. It sounds like um, the way the digital humanities work. We had yeah. um, uh, a question from uh, an author um, who uh, who was very excited to hear you were on. Uh, this is William Moner, who says that you had uh, written a, a forward to uh, an edited volume oh, yeah. called "Redesigning Liberal Education." And he says that um, in the forward, you wrote about the pragmatism of Dewey, Adams, and Du Bois, and it makes him wonder whether and how the small liberal arts colleges can really connect back to those roots, especially given the fierce and expensive competition for the four-year traditional student. Hmm. Well, uh, I, I do think the affordability issue is uh, really a, a big one, and and um, and trying to attract students uh, uh, to any expensive college these days, given the dem demographics, is, is, is going to be increasingly challenging for, for schools. I, I, I think our job is to figure out how to make the, the ideas of Adams and Jane Adams and John Dewey and W.B. Du Bois, how to make them uh, as relevant as possible in the present. I, I do believe they are relevant and 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 all three of those pragmatist thinkers would would say that's our job i mean you know we can't just say you should read john dewey because john dewey was great and he's been important and he's you know <laughs> that, that's not that's not that's a that's not a dewey in answer we have to show what's vital and why it works and what what what's empowering about it uh i i find the students uh i mean that's a pet so it's a pedagogical issue I mean, you mm. might say it's a marketing issue. I guess that mm -hmm. would be to mm -hmm. make it crass. And in some ways, it is a marketing issue. But it's a pedagogical issue. I mean, I, I teach this course of first-year students. You know, we start off with Confucius and we read mm. Aristotle and Aquinas. Mm. And, you know, I know that's most of them. That's not what they came. That's not why they're at school. That, that it's not their thing. Mm. And my job is to make this stuff seem very exciting to them. And Mm. When I started teaching this kind of material 40 years ago or 35 years ago, mm -hmm. it wasn't so hard. Not because the students were better or more open. It's just because I was closer to them in age and I understood them better. Oh. And now that I'm a, and I'm, I, have a different, I have a different relationship to them, I have to find other ways to make these thinkers uh, real to them. I yeah. do think they are real. I mean, I, I think they are powerful and help us sort through some uh, issues that face educators and institutions today. But we have to show that the students are empowered by their time at a university. I, I, for one, don't think there's any good reason to keep people at school for four years. Um, hey. uh, and I introduced a three-year program at Wesleyan some years ago now, but most people yeah. don't want it, actually, yeah. even though it saves them so much money. People like being in college. So my my attempt it hasn't worked as well as I thought it would, but I think there we have to experiment with ways of giving people an authentic and powerful college education, but outside of the eight semester framework. I mean, I think that eight semester framework just is is purely convention and doesn't have any yeah. Yeah. pedagogical uh, grounding. I think we might get past that. We might get past that. I think so. I hope um, so. You know, this is the first time anyone uh, besides me has praised Jane Adams on this program, so I just wanted to note that because it's a great <laughs> thing. Um, then uh, we had another question from uh, the uh, awesome uh, Phil Katz, and this is kind of related to the previous question, which is how do you make a non-elitist argument for the traditional liberal arts? Um, he uh, uh, you know, says so the, the, the liberal arts should not, uh, should, should, I'm sorry, they do belong to everyone, um, but there's a sense that they might not, that they're actually. So how do you make the non-elitist argument for liberal arts belonging to everybody? 
Well, that's what I try to do in Beyond the University. I, I think it's a, a, it's a it's a pragmatist argument. So I, you know, and I when I talk with all kinds of college students and and at big publics and community colleges and I've mm. done this in high schools uh, mm -hmm. as well as fancy schmancy places. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think it's uh, the distinction is between the the old argument of liberal arts as a canon that you that you kind of uh, get to master or at least uh, wear as a badge that you've you've read all that stuff you know uh, that that's not the argument for liberal arts is going to work that is an elitist argument it just shows you I'm in the club I've read here's my Plato badge here's my Aristotle badge and you know that's not I don't think it should work I think it should what should work is that um, the issues that are, the enduring questions that the philosophical tradition has wrestled with um, um, uh, remain um, uh, vital for people today. Um, and so giving some people a sense of context and, um, and a political and ethical context for mm -hmm. whatever they're interested in studying seems to me uh, democratic. Uh, so Dewey, <laughs> Dewey said, uh, you know, you can, you can have a liberal education approach to uh, auto mechanics. You can have a liberal education just mm. as much as you can to mm. uh, piano. I mean, I, I yeah. took piano lessons in college. It's very technical. You know, uh, they weren't really interested in the, for me understanding the history of the instrument. Or they, I was just learning how to play chords and, and, and scales. Now, uh, a liberal arts approach is, or a liberal education approach would actually give you some sense of context, of politics, of ethics, or, of history, um, uh, of geography. And, and, and I think that um, giving uh, somebody who's going to be an auto mechanic or uh, a bartender or uh, operate a machine in a factory a sense of how what they do fits into a larger patterns in the world, it's the yeah. absolute elitist. It's radically democratic because they deserve to know how they might think about where they sit in the world in relation to others just as much as some guy who doesn't have to work and could sit in a hammock and think about such things. Or someone who is uh, unemployed by an uh, economy redesigned by automation, perhaps. Well, you, it might be, you might be unemployed because it's redesigned or you may have a job just no, nobody's imagined yet that because right. of automation. But I think saying that that person doesn't deserve or won't be interested in understanding how what they do fits into larger patterns, whether those patterns include the arts or sociology, geography. I mean, everybody will have their particular slant. And of course, some people won't care. That's true. But to imagine that most people don't care because they're dumb or something is not anti-elitist. That's that's the, you know, the opposite of anti-elitist. <laughs> that's anti-democratic right there. I, yeah. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. That's a really, really good answer. Um, and uh, I think that's a good forward-looking answer as well. Uh, we have um, one more question from um, a uh, podcaster and uh, speaker, Michael Johnson, who asks a very direct question, uh, looking forward again. He says, why do we need so many colleges and universities in America? Yeah, well, I, I think because we have so many different kinds of people uh, in the United mm. States, and, and I, I think uh, it's a strength of the U.S. education system at, at the tertiary level that there are just so many different kinds of schools. I, I, I think there isn't an American higher education system exactly because there, there's so many different kinds of places. We may have more than we need, you know. Uh, we probably don't need these big for-profits that make right. money by just loaning uh, money that's guaranteed by the government to students. I'd love to see them eliminated. Mm -hmm. But I'm sad to see a Marlboro College go. I'm sad to see okay. Hampshire under such the rest. Because I know kids, and you, and we all do, who have, like, that was the school that saved them. That was the school mm -hmm. they found their family, their tribe, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, rather than push put people through a cookie cutter, um, ha ha finding ways to keep those schools vital and stop this corrupt support of these uh, uh, other institutions that the for-profit institutions that only exist as finance schemes to take federal dollars that are meant for loans and use them for tuition for people who never complete their degree. And if we had a decent Department of Education, instead of trying to collect the money for those places, they would close them down. Uh, but instead, we're seeing these small college, colleges that actually have uh, problems of economies of scale, to be sure, uh, not getting the help they need to solve 
the economy of scale. I mean, that really is the issue for places like Marlboro and Hampshire. Um, right. Unfortunately, they woke up to the issue too late. And um, uh, maybe not so Hampshire. I don't want to, I mean, maybe they'll, they'll figure it out, but they, they, it's hard. they, they it, it is really a hard, it is a hard problem. But you know, there are lots of enterprises in America that have figured out that the problem of scale and the, in, in relation mm -hmm. to the, the, the possibilities of craft, and whether that's on Etsy or whether it's in craft mm. beer <laughs> or bourbon, I mm. mean, um, mm. you know, when when I was growing up, there there seemed to be only uh, I don't know uh, a couple of handful of varieties of beer. Right. Now they're yeah. a gazillion. Now you might you might be of a certain spirit and say, why do we need so many kinds of beer? I think it's wonderful. Now, can you actually imagine an educational system that is? Uh, I don't know. Bespoke is the right word. I'm not even sure what it means, but people use it a lot. But it, that is that's flexible and that is amenable to different kinds of students, and that can be networked in a way to solve the problems of scale, so that we can have individualized uh, or nearly individualized education when it's right. called. I'd love to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how exactly to achieve it. You can mm -hmm. imagine a public system that had many small colleges. That under the public realm, um, rather than just these big mega universities, um, uh, with uh, that that you know are also uh, hotel and football yeah. uh, organizations. But but now so, I'm getting off track. And no, 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 that, 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 that's, a, that, that's a fascinating <laughs> idea. So in, for UMass, instead of having what three campuses, having uh, you know say fifteen, and each one has a very very narrow focus. Um, the craft focus, as you said. Yeah, and and you could and and yet you network their their procurement right. and their their yeah. back of the house functions, and so that you can you you. I mean, there really is an economy problem as well. there, but it's a, it's a problem that some enterprises manage to solve, especially if the quality of what they do or the education they produce is really high. Then you know, I I, I mean, not all schools deserve to survive. I think you know if they, but. But there are many of them that do, but they haven't had the kind of business help that will make yeah. them sustainable. Mm. You know, I see what you mean. Well, that's a really, really rich answer and a wide-ranging answer. And I can see that reflects a lot of experience you've had at the helm of uh, Wesleyan. Um, oh, thanks. Thank you, Michael, for that question. Um, friends, we're at the top of the hour. We have about 90 seconds to go. So um, I just... Uh, the time has flown by. Uh, I can I can see why your students uh, admire you so much, um, President Roth. Let, let me just ask, um, people can keep up with you in a lot of ways. Uh, on the screen, there should be a couple of widgets for people to grab your most recent books, because somehow, as an instructor and as a president, you still keep writing books too, which is remarkable. Um, we, uh, we can follow you on Twitter, which is uh, mroth78. Uh, are those the best way to keep up with you? Yeah, I have a blog on the Wesleyan uh, uh, website as well. Oh, great! Uh, it's, uh, it's called Roth on Wesleyan, and and so I I, I guess I've uh, gravitated towards Twitter <laughs> from the blog uh, uh, over the years. But uh, and then there are those Coursera classes, the modern and the postmodern, mm. uh, which and and then uh, which is two parts, and then there's the How to Change the World. And, you know, those are free and easy to access via the Coursera uh, platform if it, people are interested in, in those video lectures. Well, thank you for those. Um, and that will give people a taste of, um, of uh, what you're thinking and uh, at the pedagogical level and the philosophical, theoretical level. Um, President Roth, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your being here. Um, I, I it's, it's really generous of you to share your, your thoughts, and uh, it's been very, very helpful for, I think, all of us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. It really was a pleasure. Such good questions, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful that you included me. Oh, of course. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, don't go away, friends. I have to uh, introduce you to what we're doing next week, because we never stop moving. We always have more things coming up. Um, so next week, we have we shift grounds to talk about the flipped classroom and how the flipped pedagogy can work best. We have uh, a math professor from Grand Valley State University, Robert Talbert, who will be explaining um, his learning uh, and showing us what he discovered in his most recent book. Now, if you want to uh, also um, check out some of our previous programs, you can just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive and look back over multiple years. 
Um, and if you want to keep talking about everything that President Roth has described, everything from interdisciplinarity to the future of liberal education to how small colleges can survive and large colleges change, we're all over social media. So just head to our groups on LinkedIn and Facebook, join our Slack channel, or just join us on Twitter. In the meantime, thank you all for being such a great community. These were wonderful questions and a great discussion. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.